Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Baxter from Avanad. I'm Avanad's Global Data Platform Modernization Lead. And I'm here today with Dale Williamson. Uh, we are going to talk about an evolving trend we've been seeing uh, over the last few years around uh, two notions. One is uh, a, a concept called a data mesh, and then with Databricks Lighthouse, um, and how these patterns are converging and providing um, clients additional value um, within overall governance and, and also from um, how they manage and, and, and view their data from a, a product-based concept. Um, Dale, maybe you can tell us a few things about what, what is the, the, the industry shift to the data mesh and, and, and what are some of the trends that we're seeing over in Europe? Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, so the movement started about two years ago, and and it's 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 sort of predicated on a on a number of different things. Um, one is this need for uh, a little bit more control and 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 self service um, with your data platform. So the ability to uh, for for data owners to be able to control their own data and. Uh, to be able to organize and model and, and work with their data uh, without there being these traditional failure modes that were moving people into, um, into a centralized model. Um, and the second notion that sort of picked up, which is more related to, um, to the, the data mesh movement is this notion of data products. So the idea of publishing and owning data um, and organizing your data into these sort of product uh, sets um, that align to things that are meaningful in your organization and not necessarily to traditional data sets. Um, and there's different product data product types that we've seen form. Some are pro business product types, some are like process product types. Um, you've got insights product types, which are like derived through things like machine learning or AI. Uh, and aggregate product types, which, you know, KPIs, things like that. Um, the third element that we're seeing is, is this, um, this push to have a kind of data marketplace. So the idea is I, I want to be able to consume data that has meaning, that has context, uh, that has these relationships. And, and what we're finding is these two patterns of data mesh and, um, and lake house have helped us to sort of start to realize this, this aspiration of the data marketplace. The fourth notion is something that we're, we're doing a lot of, and we've learned this from the microservice movement uh, around domain-driven design, where we're actually measuring data usage in a similar way to like how e-commerce platforms measure the performance and behavior of products. We're measuring data usage to help us to define the domains. Um, the domains we get from sort of industry models and things like that are really useful as starter points, but actually how data is used over time starts to give us a really interesting perspective on, on the real domain that data belongs to. Uh, that's really helpful in, in reference data, master data, um, because then you actually see the static nature of the data. And, and all of this, these platform trends are, are, are sort of moving along with um, with other data trends that are more broad in the in the market, things like um, cross industry uh, models, uh, things like the patterns across industry, this lean into industry specific data platforms, um, trust of data is becoming an incredibly important thing. We're seeing this uh, across all spheres of life, um, and then of course there's uh, something really big in Europe specifically, but it's starting to pick up steam elsewhere in the world. And this is idea of security, privacy, sovereignty, um, that whole idea that, that actually data needs to be looked after by whomever is responsible for storing that. And we're seeing that across both platform, cloud platforms and edge. Um, so that's creating a huge amount of uh, complexity in what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, and I, th I think the other thing I would add, Dale, um, uh, you know, the notion of self-service data, it's been around for a while. Um, and the, the, the concept of a data mesh um, with data products is the next evolution to that to get to uh, a data marketplace. Um, that, and ultimately, that's what our clients are looking uh, and seeking is, is the notion that I can go get a, a well-known product of data 
uh, that could be uh, a single domain or it could be a hybrid of multiple domains with value add within the data itself. Um, uh, let, let's switch subjects now. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about you know the movement, the data mesh movement, and and how that's um, that's opening up a lot of opportunities here for our clients, and also uh, you know in conjunction with thinking about I'm moving to the cloud and my data is going to be in a different uh, you know more modern platform. Maybe you can talk a little bit about you know wh what is the data mesh. So. Um in the original article that the Martin Fowler Group uh, and uh, Zamach, who's the original author, um, wrote up, um, the idea was looking specifically at failure modes in, um, in a number of the different uh, data paradigms of the past. So this idea of centralized monolithic, uh, this idea of siloed um, uh, pipelines and, and also this idea of specialized um, resource. Now that had a big problem, which we've seen in application development for many years through monoliths and, and the movement that surfaced around that about 15 years ago was microservices. In much the same way, there's a number of triggers in the market that are forcing this pull apart of how data needs to be organized so that it's 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 closer to the action it's 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 more sort of relevant this idea of distribution i mean we're seeing it in the pandemic through people being sort of globally distributed not uh, centrally concentrated into a, into an office um, but we're also seeing it through other walks of life things like uh, mobile iot edge um, you know, needing to have things, you know, on demand closer to closer to where they're happening. Um, the the self-service mindset is is very centered around, you know, business being able to do more with their data themselves. So not being reliant on IT for that. Um, proprietary data that's hard to unlock, you know, applications where data is locked in, it, it's a huge problem. And, and we're seeing open standards sort of push to unlock that and the cloud providers are starting to really lean into that. Um, enterprise data governance is a massive problem that I, I think is one that we really are conscious of at Avanard and it's one that we're going after in a material way. I will talk about that during this conversation. Um, but with AI and scaling and all of these things um, and the idea of uh, you know being able to do things closer to the action, as I said, really important the the push factor is actually you know things like so, so, uh, things like privacy and security and trust and truth you know you, you would necessarily think you would want to put that data together but actually everything we're doing in the world today is pulling things apart so you need something that's more flexible and and plays to you know logically distribute the data in terms of an organizational structure so if we think about the data mesh, it's um, it's rethinking a little bit about um, where data comes from and who owns data, who's managing the data, but also how we distribute the data out. Um, is that a fair way to characterize it, Dale? It, it is a fair way to categorize it. And, 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 and something quite important is actually it doesn't always have to be a physical thing. Uh, it can also be a logical organizational construct where you're organizing your data into, into logical products that have meaning to your business and logical domains that also have meaning to your business. Whether those are physically centralized or whether they're physically distributed onto different uh, infrastructure, that's immaterial. But if you have that flexibility to have some of the data that's, that's able to sort of flex as it goes, but it, it's also about ownership and it's also about having the ability for the domain teams to own and control their own data. That's really where this sort of came about and, and triggered a big movement. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let, let's move on here um, and talk a little bit about uh, the, ma the, the overall evolution of data management, you know, starting back from probably 15, 20 years ago um, when, when, you know, data warehouses were making their entry point, uh, you know, to where we're going now with a lot of uh, cloud modernization and uh, modern uh, tools that clients are using uh, and how that, how that is, is part of this overall equation. So 
I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go into a little bit like we've, we've, we've solved some of the, the, the key failure modes. So what I've layered in here is, is failure modes uh, and also the market forces, which we just discussed. Um, on, on the right in the, in the curve is a bit more of an exponential curve. Now, this follows a very similar narrative to what the Databricks team have been talking about for some time on the lake house movement. What we've done is layer in a couple of other constructs that are happening in parallel. And, and this has been sort of trying to figure out where these different constructs play and how they can be complementary in nature. Um, so the warehouse we know, you know, it's roughly 30 to 40 years old, um, highly centralized, predicated on things like high fixed cost, low marginal cost. You know, I had scarcity of compute and storage, so therefore I need things centralized because I don't want to buy lots of servers. And, and, and that kicked off a behavior which is very much around this monolithic coupled pipeline, hyper-specialized ownership type of construct because everything was centralized. And when things are centralized, you know, you, you offset the response, the domain teams are able to re offset responsibility. And you see this a lot through, you know, how the flow of data into uh, warehouses um, sort of goes into, into action. About 10 years ago, Data Lake came about. Uh, and this was basically because there was a lot of new data, new data types, um, a lot of big data coming along, um, you know, video, uh, images. Nowadays, we've got sound, you know, even smell data. So how does that get stored in a, rash, uh, in a relational database like a warehouse? So it can't be. So the lake kind of was born. Um, and, 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 and the volume of the data is just exploded, right? Absolutely. So, so massive volumes of data. About five years ago, we started to see this kind of breakaway into the hub model. I think a lot of that was driven by things like GDPR coming about, um, but also, you know, latency is, is a huge factor. You know, if you have a global company um, and you, you don't want your, all your data to be kind of coming across from one part of the world where it's centrally stored. So hubs started to come about. Two years ago, we saw the, the rise of the data mesh and we saw the rise of the lake house. And these two, these two um, movements were happening pretty much in parallel. And what we found at Avenard is they're incredibly complementary. There is a lot that can be done together and both have helped us to kind of surge ahead. What we've seen in the pandemic is the rise of the semantic knowledge graphs as, as a clear signal. So, so this, is a, this is a very sharp sign that there's an exponential curve happening. Um, and if you follow the, the years plots, you know, 40 years, 20, uh, 10 years, five years, two years, one year, this is massive because it tells us that things are moving faster in the space. There's a lot of disruption coming. Um, we don't see each one of these being a kind of binary replacement. We are actually seeing the formation of a stack and, and, and we're working with it in that way. Like they're, they're complementary. There's a lot of learnings. We're not throwing the lake out in favor of a mesh. We're, th we're actually figuring out how these different patterns and learnings actually join together and, and give us that stack. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is democratize data and have it in a really neat organizational structure that's easy to find. Yeah, and and lend towards you know data products ultimately here, right? Um, Dale, real quick, you know there's there's a few examples that we've worked through with clients um, that that kind of show the value chain. Could could you highlight a few of the um, uh, examples we have here? So very early um, in the movement of all of this, uh, when when constructs like Delta Lake came out and, and Delta, I don't even think people have realized just how massive that innovation truly is. And it's, it's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible um, open source uh, product out there in the market today. I think that um, with that coming about and this concept of the data mesh and the idea of data products, uh, we were looking at this very early, like good probably a month or two after they came about in a financial services industry. Um, so big capital markets firm, global in nature and really interested in doing something quite different. Um, lots of challenges, simple things like uh, they have a wealth management division where um, they 
they, they quite literally have to wait to run credit risk exposure. So if they, if they have the Hong Kong market and the market closes, they can't run a credit risk exposure until the Pacific sun sets because of the coupled nature of all the data in their risk platforms. What, what we were able to do by decomposing things into more product-like function was we were able to create these, um, these almost distributed interdependencies. What we did on top of that was actually take a lot of learning from the other converging patterns happening in the stack. So there's a huge movement to change data catalog tooling, for example. There's a huge movement in the industrial space around uh, industrial IoT and digital twin. Um, there's a lot going on around edge and cloud. There's microservices, which gives us an incredible amount of learning around domains and, 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 and organizing logic into more sort of smaller composable um, bounded contexts. And, and, and things like extended reality and AI um, have given us a huge amount of signals as to actually where the world could go. So we're trying not to work in a vacuum where it's just one thing versus another. All of these things have helped us to kind of create this like graph of a business, which represents a value chain. And, and in all value chains, we're trying to figure out, you know, where is the action? Where are the, where are the where's the value? Which are the points? And where's the waste? How do we, you know, reduce the, the number of steps in the chain in order to maximize value, decrease time and, and all of those things. So we, we're starting to find that we're able to do experiments around you know, modeling um, the simple, like getting things simpler, you know, in, in the same, in the same space, we found other clients where, you know, they've got like 1400 applications in their investment banking division. That's a lot of hops for data to go through in order to yeah. form a traded product. Now, if you can bubble the data up into more of a value chain, you can actually start to see, well, what are the necessary hops if you're going to do, go on a transformation journey and modernize? You don't have to take all this legacy, you know, cauliflower architecture that's organically grown over time uh, with you. You can, you, you can reimagine how the flow of data needs to flow in a more streamlined and resilient way. Yeah, and I think that leads um, into, you know, data governance as a topic. And and if you have all this data and data uh, coming from different data owners or different sources, you know, how, how do you govern that? And 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 uh, maybe you can give us an overview of you know a client that we're working with, where you know there has been some governance thought about and introducing you know more of a distributed or federated you know paradigm of of governance. So. One of the interesting things that we learned quite early in um, reading, you know, the original Mesh article, but also looking at some of these co other converging patterns, learning from a lot of the domain-driven design approaches, but borrowing from some very old ideas. Um, so things like object-oriented programming, things like um, polymorphism. What we started to do was look at, uh, and we, we actually you know, went up a notch, we said, all right, we, we, we want data products. Um, and it, in our example that I'll talk about really quickly is we want data products in financial services. So what we did was organize bounded context first. And we thought, you know, let's go with broad domains, wealth management, investment bank, alternative data sets, alternative data sets being data from outside the organization, reference data, um, which Let's face it, I, we, we stuck with reference data because you know, master data has got too many connotations. So we stuck with, you know, this is reference data, this is data that's not gonna change too often. What we then did was model the business products that we had across the business. And we thought, okay, well, you know, in wealth management, um, we sell funds, right? We sell mortgages. So let's model a data product group based on funds and mortgages. And using that as a basis, that and then through object-oriented kind of thinking and data product thinking, we were then able to go, okay, well, you know, any, pro any fund would inherit from that fund product group. And what that naturally gave us was a couple of things. One, the business started to actually see a reflection of what they sold in the data. We were no longer talking about all the tools that make things happen behind the scenes. 
because a lot of that was abstracted away in the self-service data platform type of idea. Uh, so we put a user interface in front of that to kind of hide all the different great technologies that we were using under. And Lakehouse was one of those because it gave us a lot of strength in, um, in schema enforcement. Um, bubbling that up, uh, we were modeling data products against the simple markup language, um, which was data product groups and organizing them naturally into these domains. But the reflection that they had of the business products was what made it really powerful because it did something quite unexpected. It created a really interesting bridge between IT and business. Suddenly they were speaking the same language. Suddenly they were understanding each other. There was no longer this, this conversation about whether it's SAP or whether it's you know, some other application out there. It became very much about what the data did as a reflection of the business. And, and, and that was a really powerful thing that we discovered. Now we're doing a lot of experimenting in this type of modeling and, and, and how, what that's gonna look like. But th these sort of things and what we're finding is in a, in, a, in a sort of more consumer centric business, it's a little bit more predictable, but in a bit more of a, you know, a manufacturing type of business, we're, we're, we're leaning more into, okay, well, what does the process value chain look like? And, and how do you model that as a product? So each of these are bringing us some new ideas in what we're effectively naming federated data governance, where you're effectively creating a bit more of an ownership structure. Now, this is not radical. This is exactly how the internet works. So the internet basically has a simple markup language, HTML, it's got a simple interface, a browser, and through those two signals and a couple of basic rules, that sit behind the scenes, they're able to create actually what is effectively data governance at scale. Um, so so we, we're, we're taking a lot of signals from that thinking. That's great, Dale. Now, you know, the other concept here, I think, because of, you know, putting this back into end user or data uh, product terminology is uh, it, 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 it unlocks the data um, and brings it together at a, 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 a basis that's meaningful to the business, um, as opposed to understanding, well, this source system, this source system, or this source system, um, which I think leads into, you know, okay, we've got all this data, we've been leveraging the lighthouse. Um, uh, can you give us an example of, you know, the data and uh, the, the metadata behind it and, and how that can be managed? So interestingly enough, this is where the rubber hits the road. Like what, we, what we've done uh, in order to show the complementary nature of these, these two patterns is we've got, we've got the lake house in the, what we call the data layer. So that notion of self-service infrastructure as a platform, you know, the lake house um, architecture fits really neatly into giving us a highly performant version of that. Um, and the medallion approach that, that we've carried across is, is, is what we're doing there. Now, being Avanade, we, we, we obviously have a lean into Azure. So we use um, Azure Databricks um, and Azure Data Lake Store sits underneath that. And we're using Delta formats uh, to model the data across the bronze, silver, and gold medallions, right? Now, what that looks like in metadata land is where we're applying uh, data mesh thinking and a lot of this sort of more object oriented um, data modeling. But we're doing that in metadata and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, data is getting a lot heavier. So video is not quick to copy across. Uh, we're not, we're sort of seeing the, the amplification of sound data and things like that. But it's also easier to model when it's in metadata. You don't have to change the entire data structure. Yes, there are some quality checks and balances, but things like Delta give you a lot of very useful tools to help you to do that a lot simpler and in a more performant way. Switching back to the modeling approach, you know, you're able to, we see the silver zone as a really good space for creating a, a, a almost denormalized setup for your data products. And, and as I said before, we've got these different data product types uh, and we've got different data product groups. So data product types being, you know, your business data products 
And, and those are the ones that you're bringing in from your data sources across the organization. Insights product types are, um, are things that you know, are derived. Uh, and then of course you have process data product types, which are almost more around business processes and how those are, are, are sort of modeled. We we're still working on that last aspect and that's become a really interesting sort of area of exploration for us. What we then do is we create different reflections. Uh, and in the example that I'm showing you here is one that we pulled from a bunch of uh, major healthcare providers that we are doing this work with. Um, now in this example, what we're starting to see is in healthcare, you have different metrics globally. So you have the metric system, imperial system, but then there's also different ways of modeling data. Uh, you have minimalist data synthesis versus statistical data synthesis. So these are two absolutely different ones that are adopted by different countries. Uh, so we went, well, we'll just create both. You know, why not? Um, we also have created other reflections. So using um, ICD-11, which is a, a health reporting standard, we also used a, a, an open source ontology, CCAM, which unfortunately has been deprecated since, but we're working on a new sort of version of that ontology. And this is giving us that, that early start and signal um, of what a data, data marketplace could look like. All of this happening in sort of the metadata land, all using a lot of the, the thinking behind the data mesh around products and domains, but adding our own sort of evolution to that in terms of how we model things, which we call our unified analytics modeling approach. It's great, Dale. And if we uh, talk about, you know, how do you bring this to life from a use case perspective? Um, the key building blocks of that and, and the abstraction into, you know, more of uh, 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 functions that we're performing. Maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. So we want to we want to make this a lot sort of more open to our uh, to our clients. And, and we've kind of gone with this idea of, well, the data infrastructure is a platform. We wanna provide that as a service to our clients so that they can actually do a lot more of the, the data, the metadata modeling of data, and they can do a lot of their own um, more democratized data management and, and ownership, which is, fits into that federated data governance model. So it's almost providing the tools two businesses behind a very simple interface that allows them to create their data products from data sets uh, that they register and manage. We also want to, um, want to democratize the governance, so create that whole ownership structure. And then what we're leaning into at the moment is how do we create sort of more data marketplace type of signals? And, and, and all of this is all packaged into, into something that we're calling the use case factory because we wanna do these in use cases to get that sort of evolutionary and, and, and sort of incremental programmatic um, data platform evolution from that, that the cloud provides us. Thank you. Um, and, and I would say this is a journey, right? You, you're not going to lay down a data mesh and, and map your entire organization in one fell swoop. So um, th this leads us towards, uh, you know, concluding here. Um, Avanad's here to help. We, we provide data architecture uh, assessments and guidance. Um, uh, we, we can help with your users and usage profiling, um, which lead towards, you know, how, how can a data mesh help? We can help with the data value chain, which we talked about, which is end-to-end -end mapping of data sources and, and the value back to the business. Um, and then also if there's innovation that's required to show how a data mesh can fit in with your organization, um, we've got services around that. And, and with that, uh, I would thank everyone um, and enjoy the Data and AI 2001 Summit. Um, and uh, Dale, any final words here? No, uh, it's all fun and um, we're loving every minute of the journey and we'd love it if, uh, if you, you know, popped us a note and, uh, and just asked a few questions. It'd be great to network and, and, and compare notes. Thanks everyone.